Welcome everybody to our latest AES Tech event. Tonight we are doing a wonderful story with in history and trip down memory lane for some, I'm sure, on the broadcast tape cartridge machines. Well, welcome everybody. I suppose you've been looking at these uh, weird little machines on the table here. Some of you remember them. Some of you may have never seen them in your young lives, but this is the way the broadcast uh, companies played all their commercials and a lot of their music back in the uh, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, up through the 90s when uh, computers took over. So <clears throat> tonight we are lucky to have one of the guys who was in at the very ground floor of building and conceiving cartridge machines. Andy Rector came to work for Automatic Tape Control in Bloomington, Illinois in 1965 and then through a series of events Automatic Tape Control was purchased by Gates Radio or Harris Corporation in Quincy and some of the people who went over did not like Quincy homesick for Bloomington, and several guys had stayed behind, among them Andy Rector. And Andy was uh, with Jack Jenkins, and Elmo Franklin was invited to form a company called International Tapetronics, and they became the premier manufacturer of cart machines. Over the years, uh, they were sold to 3M, and Andy moved away to work on some other projects and then came back to Bloomington and went to work for Autocord Corporation. They built these machines and Andy ultimately purchased the company from Carl Martin and stayed till the bitter end of cart manufacturing and then decided that uh, he would look for another means of revenue, and he has been very, very successful in doing printed circuit board assembly and testing. So, with that said, Andy, it's uh, all yours. Thank you, Jeff. Is this one working? Or do I need that one? This one, I think we can do without that one. Well, um, I had the uh, distinct pleasure of growing up in southern Kentucky under the Nashville uh, broadcast umbrella um, and got probably uh, a lot of my education, maybe a little bit too much, uh, because by the time I got my little five-tube uh, bedside radio, I would spend up uh, a good part of the night listening, primarily at that time, to uh, WSM. And so I knew every NBC radio show, I think, that uh, existed and that uh, was reflected sometimes in my grades. But I grew up on a farm, and for some reason or the other, I wanted to get involved in broadcasting. And finally, in about 1953, Russellville, Kentucky had its first radio station. And uh, so I started... Uh, perking my interest and hanging around and uh, knew the manager of the station and so forth and um, got to do a teenage uh, rock show and then uh, got invited to help out on weekends and things of that nature. Uh, ended up, uh, and because of that Nashville umbrella, um, the broadcast umbrella, I, I really was confused as a young kid because I was living in Kentucky but all the news came from Nashville and I was confused about whether I was a Tennessean or a Kentuckian. And uh, we sp shopping in Nashville and all that sort of thing. So I feel right at home in Nashville, and I really do appreciate uh, your being kind enough to let me talk with you tonight. Uh, I'm kind of wondering if uh, you've run out of ideas for uh, these meetings, or if you're just gluttons for punishment, <laughs> because uh, the tape cartridge machine, um, to, in some way was kind of a, a, a love-hate relationship for many uh, broadcast engineers and announcers as well. But if we're going to talk about cartridge machines, we really need to go back and uh, take a look at where the, their origins were, and I'm going to make sure that this unit is working. Yeah, we're going to be there. Um, 
It's interesting that audio uh, magnetic tape recording had been discovered, and I just was reading the other day that some patents existed clear back in the 1890s, and I haven't figured that out, and I didn't have time to do a lot of research on it, but, uh, you know, we've always had people that will patent something, even though they haven't gotten quite to the point of uh, being able to, to make it fully work. But, and then we had wire recording, magnetic again, and all that sort of thing, but it was, uh, in the, and the Germans had ma uh, magnetic tape recorders using tape like much like we know today in the 1930s. But they really never got uh, to the point that the quality was good enough for the concept to catch on. So let me get used to this. Um, okay, where are we here? And I'm gonna have to do Okay, I think I'm going to have to use that. Uh, during the war, uh, a guy named Jack Mullen was stationed in uh, the UK, and he, his assignment was to listen to radio coming from Germany. And as time went along, he um, was aware that Hitler was speaking from Berlin on the radio, but intelligence said that Hitler was actually in Munich or someplace like that. And he thought, this quality is unbelievable. What's going on? Uh, we're, either the intelligence is wrong or the Germans have come up with a better concept for a tape recording. Well, okay, I'm going to have to continue to do this, I think. So, um, and that's kind of the, a, a good example of the poor uh, audio that was generally coming from recording techniques at that point in time. All right, let's see, where are we here? Uh, after the invasion of uh, Germany, uh, Mullen was reassigned and he went to the continent and was stationed actually in France and one of the things that he was uh, looking for was this magic machine that was giving them the tremendous audio quality. He found some German magnetophones or tape recorders in, in English, um, but the audio on those units were, was really poor and so he thought this is not what I was looking for. Let me see. No, we're not there yet. So uh, Mullen's was Mullen was uh, dispatched to Frankfurt because there was a huge tower in Frankfurt that was perceived to be the uh, uh, origin of radio frequency interference that had been a pain in the latissimus for uh, the Americans on bombing raids of Europe. Dent Marsh, you're laughing about latissimus. That is not the butt, it is a uh, muscle in your back, so it's a pain in the back, so <laughs> latissimus. It's, it's, <laughs> it's Latin in case <laughs> you know that. <laughs> so anyway, um, so uh, Mullen was dispatched to look uh, for that radio frequency. You're going to do that for me? You know which one it is? Uh, this one here, so. So I'll just give you the high sign. Uh, so he made a, a, a side uh, a, a trip to uh, the uh, uh, to Frankfurt to look uh, for this tower, and he got there, and he found in the basement of this uh, facility huge uh, electrical generators, big diesel engines, and so forth. But when he got to the upper stories, everything had been stripped out. So it was a, a futile trip that he made, and. As he drove down off this mountain, he got to the end of the road, and the question was, do I turn right and go back to France? Or I've heard that they have a, a pretty interesting operation over at Radio Frankfurt. So he finally made the decision to go to Radio Frankfurt, got there, and the British had taken over Radio Frankfurt at that point. And so he started asking, he said, uh, about the, the tape recorders, and one of the guys said, we have a machine here that you won't believe. So he actually showed him the... Uh, uh, machine and demonstrated the quality and Mullen knew that he had found what he had been marveling about uh, in the way of a new recorder. 
So he photographed all the uh, instruction manuals and schematics and later discovered that the secret ingredient was AC bias. And interestingly enough, AC bias was an accidental discovery. And I, it uh, has always occurred to me that it's sort of like the fuzz pedal, I think. It, remember when I think it was a Marty Robbins uh, record that came out and the thing had this really fuzzy sound and everybody was thinking, it, apparently an amplifier had gone bad, it was oscillating and it created the sound. Now everybody has a fuzz uh, a pedal. So in this case, and today I've got a, a document that says that nobody fully understands exactly how bias works. There are theories, there are a lot of different theories, but nobody has apparently come up with the universally accepted uh, explanation for the whole thing. So, um, I just talked about that, so let's <laughs> do it again. Get ahead of myself. So, uh, while he was in France, uh, Mullen was able to uh, liberate two uh, magnetophones, and he then took them apart, piece by piece, and shipped them to himself or his mother in California, along with 50 reels of uh, tape. And uh, that's a picture of one of the early magnetophones. Uh, I don't know if that's one of the, uh, the AC bias machines or not. I apologize, I'm standing in front of you guys, so I'll move back here a little bit. Uh, but at any rate, it's a pretty crude looking machine. I tend to think that that might have been one of those lower quality machines that he found in France. Let's go again. Oh, 30 inches per second. I had the good fortune at an AES show in New York in 1989 of talking with Jack Mullen. And he was there with his huge collection of reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders and conducting tours and talking about these machines. A, a really fascinating guy. And by the way, I have, uh, there's an AES, um, the, my version is a VHS uh, tape of an afternoon with Jack Mullen. And if you guys are interested in delving into this thing anymore, he is a treasure trove of information about reel-to-reel uh, -reel tape recorders. So I said, Jack, I have one question for you. I said, 30 inches per second. Now, um, if I remember correctly, uh, Napoleon had come up with the metric system in the 1800s sometime and, and the Germans had adopted it. And so why did they come up with a speed in inches per second? And he said, you know, I've never been asked that question before and I don't know the answer. He said, off the cuff, I would say that they went down, got a, machine, a motor to drive this darn machine and it worked at 30 inches per second. And now everything is a division of 30 inches per second in the tape recording world. So, okay, let's go ahead. Uh, but uh, that was a really interesting conversation, and he was a really, uh, and again, it, uh, I added that, and that was 1989. Okay, we're ready to go. So, uh, after he got home to the United States, back to San Francisco, Mullen uh, took those machines, put them back together, and he wanted to come up with his own electronics. He did add some preemphasis to, pre to improve the frequency response and make them sound even better than the Germans had uh, done it. And then he decided that the machines were ready for show. And so he takes them to LA and he thinks that the future of uh, the magnetic tape recorder is going to be in the movie industry. So he goes down to Hollywood, you know, to show them off. Oddly enough, that wasn't the secret, so let's go again. So here is Mullen showing his mo a modified magnetophone with Murdo McKenzie, who happens to be Bing Crosby's technical producer, and also in that trip, he shows them to a guy named Alexander M. Ponatov. Now notice his initials. Alexander was in the business of building electric motors for aircraft and things of that nature, high quality precision motors, and he thought maybe those motors might be able to be used in tape recorders. So, Bing Crosby, the cream of singer, the blue of the night, it's the goal of the day, I'm one Wait for me. 
Good example of the poor audio quality that uh, Bing Crosby was faced with in trying to produce his radio show. And for some reason or the other, he was kind of interesting in that he did not like to do live radio. He preferred to have sort of a creative license for everybody that was on his show to let them go off and do what they wanted to do and if they used dirty language or something like that he wanted to get rid of it of course and he had to make it fit into whatever amount of time Philco was paying for his uh, radio show at that point. So he hires Mullen to come in and record his shows, edit those shows, and then put them on, I think it was ABC, but I'm not real sure about that, so let's go again. Pretty soon, this whole concept became so popular that they needed more reel-to-reel -reel machines in order to do all this editing and so forth. And they uh, turned to, let's go, uh, <laughs> Mr. A.M.P.E.X., Mr. Potatoff, and they produced the first Ampex tape recorders, the Model uh, 200. An early introduction ad for Ampex. So, at that point, um, we had a new machine. That's, yeah, thank you. Uh, tape recorders, without question, revolutionized both broadcasting and the recording industries. What a fantastic improvement it was over the lacquer discs and things that they had at that time. And Ampex, of course, was followed by a number of other brands who uh, were copycat type things like the Berlantz, the Scullys, the Magnacord, Revox, Studer, what other? Wallensack? Anybody else remember any of those? Crown. What's that? Crown. Crown? Yeah, Crown had a recorder. You're right. So, of course, reel-to-reel -reel machines were well suited for those half-hour radio shows and one-hour radio shows, whatever they needed. Any of you guys uh, claim to be a combo operator? <laughs> one back here, anybody else? Well, if you remember at that time, uh, we had moved from having half-hour radio shows and hour radio shows to short segments of information, a two-and-a-half-minute music selection, followed by X number of commercials, followed by a jingle, and who knows what else. And that was called Top 40 Radio. Let's go again. And they were, those operators were really, I, I can remember um, one of my uh, first uh, full-time jobs was at uh, a station WQOK in Greenville, South Carolina. And we had Berlant reel-to-reel -reel machines that we had to thread and queue up to the seventh commercial or seventh cut on that tape, rock it back and forth to get it all set, queue a record, find a copy for the next commercial and all kinds of things like that. It was a busy place to go. Let's go to the next slide and in Bloomington, Illinois, a company called Molik Specialties was building a background music machine which, uh, it's, it's coming up here, so it, uh, we'll not use, there's one down here, which I have in my collection. Uh, and they were using these endless loop tape cartridges. Uh, anybody not seen a tape cartridge? It's, it's kind of a flawed concept, but they were extremely popular and they made a lot of money for radio stations over the years. Uh, were invented by a guy named George Esch at a company called uh, Cousineau. And let's go to the next slide. And uh, this is a picture of this machine that's sitting right here. And uh, that's the background music. And, and it, it, I think those ran at three and three quarters and had wow and flutter like I don't know if it was measurable or not. It was terrible. Uh, but uh, and 30 minute cartridges. This is an A size cartridge which could hold up to about 10 minutes. There was a B size cartridge, I think, that essentially went to about 15. And then there was a C size cartridge which filled that entire slot on that machine all the way across. And it would hold about 45 or uh, maybe 60 minutes of uh, tape. They were great. Except that it required lubricated tape and after those cartridges had run, layer on layer, slipping and sliding and so forth, the lubricant would wear off, they would bind, 
If you had an eight track machine, I can't remember how many times you'd drive down the highway and see where some guy had thrown it out the window and there was tape all over the highway. Well, that's what happened to these cartridges as well. But at any rate, uh, they weren't great for that background music thing, but a guy named Vern Nolte, and this, uh, I don't know how this next transition is gonna work, but go ahead to that one. Okay, it, uh, Vern Nolte was the general manager of WJBC in Bloomington at that time, and he had seen one of these cartridge machines, and he thought, I wonder if we could play jingles and, and commercials on these things. So he buys one, and then he goes uh, and wonders, uh, as I said there, and so he goes out to the WJBC transmitter, let's go to the next one, and consults with his engineers, uh, Fred Bailey, affectionately referred to as Ted, I never did figure out that one, but Fred and Ted, and Jack Jenkins, another Jack in the tape recording business, and Jack had a huge impact on, on the cartridge machine over the years, so let's go ahead to the next one. And Bailey and Jenkins came up with a concept and they built three prototypes which they installed at WJBC. And let's go ahead. Uh, Viking decks were used, much as in this machine down here, uh, with belt drive motors. And seven and a half inches, uh, these were three and three quarters, so they wanted to get, improve the audio quality, so they ran them at a faster speed. And they used a gear motor. Uh, which would cause the solenoid to come up into position and uh, drive the tape. And for those of you, this cartridge is different from an 8-track because it has a hole in the bottom and the pressure roller would go up through there, engage the tape against the cap to, capstan shaft, and then when the Q-tone was sensed, it would drop out and the tape would stop ready to be played again. So it was really a, a, a great automation tool. Uh, but that was a very uh, slow process of pulling the pressure roller up and so the machines weren't real fast uh, but they believed from the outset that they needed to have a full swing pressure roller in other words push the button everything happened from there so let's move ahead they used a one kilohertz Q-tone on the tape and they had a they used a stereo head program on the top channel and a Q-tone on the bottom and uh, they happened to use one kilohertz because Ted had uh, some one kilohertz oscillators in his uh, garbage bag and, and uh, pulled them out. The machines went into use at WJBC and they were shown at the Illinois Broadcasters Convention in October of 1958. Automatic tape control was then, they felt like they had a concept and so automatic tape control was uh, created uh, by the owners of the Daily Pantograph in Bloomington and WJBC, the same owners, uh, the Ives, the Merwins, and the Stevensons, and that's Adley Stevenson, by the way. Uh, but they had no manufacturing or marketing capability. So Bailey and Jennings uh, and, and uh, Jenkins at that point went to uh, Quincy, Illinois to show Parker Gates what they had. And I don't know if you ever met Parker Gates or not, but he always had a pipe, and I can just kind of see him smoking that pipe and say, well, boys, I've got a machine here that we're going to introduce, and it's going to revolutionize broadcasting. So he told them about the Gates ST-101. So Jenkins and Bailey came back to Bloomington somewhat dejected, trying to figure out what they were going to do, and they sent, shipped off some prototypes to WIZZ and Streeter, Illinois, and they were real happy with them. And so then, uh, they showed them to a Collins salesman, Collins Radio. And he went back to Cedar Rapids, where Collins was located at that time. And the next thing they knew, John Hurley, the sales manager for uh, Collins Radio Company, called up and asked for an appointment. Called Ted Bailey and said, uh, wonder if we could talk about this machine you have and see if we can do something together. And Ted said, well, when do you want to talk? He said. How about lunch today? <laughs> so Hurley jumps in a plane, flies from Cedar Rapids to Bloomington, and signed a marketing agreement over lunch. And the plans were set for the introduction of the machine at the 1959 NAB, which was held at the Conrad Hilton in uh, Chicago. Molex Specialties, the builder of the background music machine, assembled the first uh, 
cartridge machines, the ITC or the ATC machines, using Viking decks and a big linear solenoid that now replaced that a rotary solenoid and, and actually was a linear device that pulled the pressure roller from off to a complete run position, full swing pressure roller. Continuing that concept. ATC uh, built the modular cube electronics at the radio station and Collins built the cases. And these were all tube electronics. <laughs> the absence of ventilation created a little bit of a problem. The machines arrived in uh, Chicago along with the cases from Cedar Rapids and they quickly found out that under the lights of the uh, NAB show these machines were overheating and weren't working properly. Allied Radio is located in Chicago. They go down there, they say we've got to have some diodes that will take a higher temperature and they worked all night replacing the diodes and the show opens the next day to Conrad Hilton and the Collins ATC P-Series cartridge machine was the hit of the show as I understand it. Wasn't there. So they generated more than $100,000 in sales to 45 radio stations at that show and they were faced with one little problem. <laughs> so, back to Bloomington and try to figure out how we're going to do it. Now, at this point, a reminder to me, I remember when I went to automatic tape control in 1965, I was constantly talking with engineers from all over the country. And I remember one particular guy from Texas that said, oh no, he said, ATC didn't have the first machine. I had a cartridge machine operating in whatever year prior to that. And so I modified my pitch and I said, ATC had the first commercially available cartridge machine. So I haven't had too many people argue about that point, but there's kind of an interesting thing that happens here. Simultaneously, Ross Bevel, at, uh, who was the chief engineer, Question. Yeah. How about Lear? Was it Norman Lear? The commercial Lear? It, interestingly enough, it, not Norman Lear, but uh, what's his first name? Bill Lear. Phil Lear. He happened to be from Quincy, Illinois. And how does he fit in all of this? That's an eight track. So he all of this was happening, and that comes later. I thought he had a four track. Were, Did he have a four track? It was for playing in the planes. Was, in planes. Was I, I have heard that. Yeah. yeah. And it was basically in, in line with this machine down here, the, the background music type machine. But he never went for the broadcasting industry for some reason. So Ross Bell was in uh, D.C. working on the Spotmaster concept. And that was shown at a D.C. area audio hi-fi show in the fall of 1958. And remember that uh, ATC had uh, the Illinois Broadcaster show, so this is comparable to that. And that's uh, an old machine, but uh, let's see, I thought we had one. That's a tape caster there. Okay, so let's move ahead. And um, Bevel was apparently, and I, at the end of this, there's a credit here. There's a guy at, uh, in Iowa who did a graduate uh, paper for his master's degree who captured this whole industry, uh, history of the industry, and I borrowed liberally from his writings to put this thing together. But uh, anyway, I want to give him credit for that. Uh, so he shows up at the NAB show in, in Chicago and sees the P-Series machine from automatic tape control and Collins radio, and uh, that's the first time he knew about it. Uh, Broadcast Electronics then was chartered in 1959 to both manufacture and market the machines and as I pointed out, ATC did not have either of those capabilities. It relied on Collins for the uh, uh, marketing and, and uh, Mullet for the machines. They used a beefed up uh, Viking deck and belt drive motor and they, um, Bevel had chosen independently, because he didn't know anything, anybody else was working on this, an 850 hertz uh, Q-tone, which he changed apparently after seeing the ITC machine in Chicago. So uh, that must have influenced him. Uh, and rumor has it they built about 50 machines with the 850 uh, hertz tone. Slightly different head configuration, if any of you are around at that time, they were using single track heads, one with the track on the top for program material, flip it over and record the, uh, uh, the Q-tones on the lower track. 
ATC, and I can't ever remember which way it was. I think the program track preceded the uh, Q track, which was in the second head position. So if you played those cartridges in uh, Spotmaster, they'd over Q and you'd hear the first little bit of it audio. Mm -hmm. And if you did it the other way, there would be a pause before the uh, commercial start. So, uh, and they also used a manual lever. Uh, this tape caster here has a, a button that, um, that does that for you. They went to a full swing pressure roller as well. Okay, so let's move ahead. And uh, they did, they were ahead on the, uh, the electronics. They used transistor playback electronics and tube type recorders. I think uh, transistors weren't really good for oscillators at that point or somebody didn't know how to do them, but they weren't used a lot for uh, the recording process. First production model was sold uh, to uh, WQSN in Charleston, South Carolina. That came from my friend in, uh, in Iowa. And Austin Knox was the uh, primary engineer, and Jack Neff, who uh, used to run into at all the uh, shows, uh, was the sales manager. Also, there were some other competing formats, and I, it's kind of interesting. I'd forgotten about some of these. The McKinsey 5CP program repeater was introduced in 1959. You recorded the tape on a reel-to-reel -reel machine, wound it into a magazine, spliced the tape, and then painted on a reflective uh, strip at the beginning of the cartridge and then played them back. A lot of work to get the same amount of uh, re results. And then, of course, we talked about Parker Gates. He had uh, come up with the 101, or the engineers in Quincy had. They used a 13-inch wide tape belt and had 101 slots. He would move mechanically move the uh, uh, slide mechanism across the front of the machine to select which one of those 101 cuts and had a maximum of 90 seconds of uh, audio and had an upper uh, audio frequency limit of about 8 kilohertz. RCA also had a wide belt machine, but it never reached the market. That was in 1959 also. And so I'm not quite sure what happened to that machine. The Schaefer company, who had been building some program automation systems, had taken Ampex reel-to-reel -reel machines and modified them, and they put windows in the tape, and they had a, a light sensing device on it, and they could tell when they had advanced from one cut to the next. So they could count uh, 56 cuts and get play you the 57th uh, commercial, that sort of thing. Okay, and uh, then RCA also had a magnetic disc recorder in 1959. It used a disc about the size of a 45 RPM record, it ran at 33 and a third uh, RPM, and it could be cued manually or automatically in a changer. There was one of those in the ceiling at uh, automatic tape control, and I always wondered what happened to that thing. I would have loved to have played with it. So let's go. Ampex uh, also introduced a, an AG100 Qmatic machine in 1965. It used 11 and 3 quarter inch discs, magnetic discs, uh, for in their uh, advertising announcements and other program material by radio stations. And that may have well been the first floppy disk. A big son of a gun. <laughs> so, okay. Early competing machines, the, we've been talking about the P-Series, and Bob Mabin, by the way, that first shot of uh, the P-Series machine, Bob had refurbished, beautiful machine, and he brought me this record playback unit combination. That's the first P-Series uh, Collins, marketed by Collins, and, uh, and, and by the way, I, lest I forget it, ATC always had a tremendous respect for Collins Radio with regard to the quality they demanded. They were hard on ATC and, and pushed them to the limits on trying to improve the quality and reliability of the cartridge machines. And that had a tremendous impact on Jack Jenkins thinking about how to build uh, cartridge machines. And then, of course, uh, long, uh, later in years, uh, the uh, ATC, after the split with Collins, came up with the Criterion series and we had the Spotmaster again, and another uh, 
uh, this is the Collins 642. After the split with automatic tape control, they designed their own machine. And it was very, very similar to the uh, PB series that uh, ATC had introduced. Okay. And then, of course, Gates had the cartridge tape. So they had their, finally, the Spot 101, I guess, went away, and they had their own cartridge machine. And then I've used here, because uh, we don't talk about it too much, but this is the uh, Molik. Uh, and Molik has gone by several names. Molik, Bill Molik is the founder of the company. They went to introduce their first machines under the Makarta brand, and then later changed that to Sonomag Corporation, SMC. Okay. Uh, and then, of course, RCA had the uh, uh, machine built by Ampro. And later on, Lupus says the one with the big button in the middle, and I, I don't know whether that's a different series or what, but this is representative of one of the RCA cartridge machines. And then, of course, on the West Coast, Bill Oberhauser uh, came up with his cartridge machine uh, under the Sparta label. And Paul Shore came along and sort of replicated some of the uh, broadcast electronics ideas with the tape caster. And he sold at a lower uh, price. That's a later model. It's similar to the one that's here. And uh, but at first he had the one that you had to put the cartridge in, pull the lever back to get into a ready position, small solenoid to close the gap and run the tape. 